So I, pre I appreciate this opportunity to, to be in front of you and, and to uh, uh, talk to you about uh, logic modeling and um, how I've taken the ideas of logic modeling to help uh, improve my productivity in the scholarship of teaching and learning. And as, as you can see, there's a couple of points in this title that, that I, I want to start by clarifying. How, how many of you are familiar with the scholarship of teaching and learning? When, when you hear that title, does it, do you feel pretty comfortable in, okay, what does that mean? So, so, so mo, mo, most, most, most don't then. So let me spend just a little bit of time uh, talking about that and getting us on the same page. Um, as, as you look, there, there's, um, through, through the history of the scholarship of teaching, there's kind of three broad categories that often get discussed. They're called, called good teaching, scholarly teaching, and then the scholarship of teaching and learning. And, and, and good teaching is often about what, uh, if, you, if you took the, the, pulled the students and say, said, who are the good teachers? And, and you took that poll and then you went and assessed the teachers. They would be those type of teachers that would be really popular. They would be engaging and, 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 and well prepared. But they may not necessarily be using uh, good pedagogy. And that's where, that's where scholarly teaching comes in is it starts to really look at the art and science of the teaching. Is what you're doing based on best practices that is known about how we learn? And then the highest step of that model is the scholarship of teaching and learning. So it takes the ideas about good teaching and pedagogy, but then it takes that second piece that becomes critical how do you know your students are learning? How are you assessing that? How are you, how are you measuring that? So that piece of student learning is critical to get to that highest level of scholarship of teaching and learning. And then the second component of that is that that becomes where, where the peer review comes in. There's some type of forum that what you are doing is being evaluated by your peers, you're receiving feedback. Um, the, and, and to me, the highest level of that then would be publications in peer-reviewed uh, teaching journals. And so that, that's a quick uh, conversation to kind of talk about why it becomes. So, so, so if, you, if you're aiming for that type of rigor in, in your teaching and you're aiming for these total projects, then this, this presentation will make sense to you. It, will, it, it can help you as you uh, make movement toward that. How many of you are familiar with the TURB logic modeling? Okay, so again, not, not, not very many. Um, so logic modeling is a series of if-then statements. And it's often used in program evaluation to assess whether a program is obtaining its desired out outcomes. Uh, logic modeling includes inputs, activities, outputs, and outcomes. So let's say you're designing, in my field in human development and family studies, Let's say that I was designing a marriage enrichment workshop. I would look at the resources I have. Those would be the outputs. I would talk about the activities that I'm doing and, and then if they produce the desired effects. Here's an example of what a traditional logic model looks like and, or sounds like, and this is, this is in your uh, PowerPoint. If funding, which would be an input, can provide, uh, can be provided, then parenting classes can be offered. If classes, so you see, so you'll see these if words and then words. If classes, the activities can teach about child development and parenting skills output, then parents can acquire knowledge, gain skills, and change their attitudes about how to care for their children, which would be an initial outcome. If they learn new approaches in dealing with their children, 
Then they will change their behavior to reflect these new methods, an intermediate outcome. If they change their behavior, then they will increase the likelihood of positive childhood outcomes such as healthy emotional development. So this, this logic model is basically, basically taking you through these series of steps of saying, if you have the resource and you can provide a parenting class and you can change the parent's attitude, the end result is going to be healthy development in a child. And so that's an example of the traditional logic model. In 2011, um, have any of you gone through, or any of you, did any of you go through Peter Selden's training? Um, Peter Selden is very, he, he's, he's uh, very well known in portfolio development and, and helping professors kind of through the tenure, tenure process. And in 2011, I had the opportunity to be one of the faculty members that uh, came up here to the Logan campus for a week and, 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 and learned from, from his expertise. And he made a comment that really made me stop and reflect. And his comment was something along the lines of this, your teaching philosophy should be the foundation for how students learn in your class. So I want you to just kind of reflect about that. Your teaching philosophy, how do you believe people learn, students learn? This should form the foundation for really everything you're doing in your classroom. And as I reflected on this statement, I started to realize that the pr principles I was comfortable with in logic modeling for program evaluation <coughs> could also be applied to my teaching. To do this, I changed my inputs into my teaching philosophy and learning goals, my activities into my teaching, and my outputs and my outcomes into my student learning. So this, so, so you, you have this slide, slide it's, in, it's in your handout. So I want you to stop and, and, and I, I, I want you to reflect. So here's what we're trying to do with this is we're trying to start at the very beginning of your teaching philosophy. Your teaching philosophy should impact your learning goals, which should impact the way you teach. And then most importantly, it should impact your evidence of student learning. So I want you to reflect on a class, one of the classes that you teach. And I want you to reflect on that for a moment. I want you to start thinking to yourself, What's my philosophy for that particular class? Does that impact my learning goals? Does it impact the way I teach? And most importantly, how am I documenting that my students are learning? So I'm going to start with my teaching philosophy. And I, I, I have that, that, that that's, part of a, that's part of a copy in your, in your handout. It's included on page five or four. And I just want to, I, I want to share my philosophy with you so that you can see how this philosophy colors everything I do in my classes. So my philosophy is three words. Learn, apply, and share. And in the learn piece, I believe that students construct knowledge. In my classes that are based in family science, I believe that students come in there with the model 
of how families work. They come in there with the model of how marriages work. These models are based mostly on the families of origin that they grew up in. What they see, what they heard as a child. How were problems solved? How was affection shown? All of these make up these models. They don't know that they have these models. And they often don't, aren't, able, aren't even able to express why a lower functioning model may lead to unhealthy practices compared to a healthy model. But they know they have this model. And so my goal in the learning piece is to help modify their model so that they start to see these subtle differences between families that are working well and functioning highly and there's just comfort and peace and support in their home versus families where there's stress and there's contention. So I have a quote on my teaching philosophy that really illustrates this model of how a, how a, how a student's model was challenged because of this class, and it's in parentheses there, or italics, I should say. It says, early in our marriage, each one of the four horsemen at one time or another reared its ugly head. And in this class, they learn about the four horsemen are criticism, contempt, defensiveness, and stonewalling. Families that have those usually don't function very well. So she's saying, I realize this was alive and well in my marriage. At the time, I was not aware of the impact they could have on my marriage. In fact, if I can be honest, I thought they were perfectly fine ways of communication. After all, it is what I observed in my own parents' marriage. Although I knew it did not feel right to treat my spouse this way, I had not learned appropriate ways to communicate. After 10 years of marriage, life experiences, spiritual enlightenment, and counseling, I now have a much clearer path of what makes a healthy marriage. Marriage takes time, renewed commitment, and paying attention to the little things. So this was a student that was coming into class, and at the end of the class, she said, my mental model changed. I, I started to see things differently. So the learn piece to me of my philosophy is about changing students' mental models of how families work. The second piece of my philosophy is apply. Most of you or many of you have probably been exposed to Ken Bain's book, What the Best <laughs> College Professors Do. He has this wonderful quote. It says, learning occurs when students have made a sustained, substantial, and positive change in how they think, act, and feel. In my classes, it's really important to me that the students not only learn, but they apply what they're learning to themselves. I feel fortunate. I look at my friend Don Busenbark here from the base, and he teaches math. <laughs> I feel bad for math teachers. I feel fortunate to be in my field, because so much of what we're talking about is relevant, and I'm sure it's all relevant, Don, to them <laughs> in their personal lives. But on a day-to-day -day basis, the content of my material speaks to them. They see it in their daily lives. So apply to me is also about them applying the material to themselves. And then the share piece of my philosophy is about how, how I teach at a regional campus. Utah State University is very important to our community. And so I take the opportunities for my students to share what they're learning with members of the community. We do radio spots. They develop radio ads. We do workshops, parenting workshops, marriage workshops. So I want to take, I want to take now um, this, and, and I want to introduce two assignments to you. So one, one, one is called, um, so, so as you look through, I wish I had a pointer here. So I want you to look at, Let's see.
So I want you to follow through. If you, if you go here to this first box under my teaching philosophy. So my, my philosophy is about learning, right? There's an arrow here. So that's my teaching philosophy, the piece that's impacting this. It's going to impact two of my learning goals. The first learning goal on the top, describe and explain family lives, facts, theories, and concepts. My second box under learning goals is understanding couples, marriages, and family interaction patterns that promote strong families. So to do this, I, I, start to do, I take those goals, and in the, the uh, third and fourth box down under teaching, I introduce two particular assignments that I think are going to impact students' abilities to do that. The first assignment, and it's in that third box under teaching, is concept mapping. Are, anybody, is any, are any of you familiar with concept mapping? Okay, tell me what you know about it. It's basically a bunch of bubbles that you connect together. It's a bunch of bubbles, it's a bunch of ideas, huh? And it, and it has its roots in the physical sciences. Uh, it, it's really used a lot in the sciences. And so that, that, became, that became a critical assignment of mine is how is to implement concept mapping and then, and then the fourth box down under teaching, I have them take their assignment and I have them write a three-page paper that describes, the, the, they, they write in narrative what the concept map is telling, is, is telling them. And if you look on page, if you look on page um, after my teaching philosophy, this page right here of your handout, those, those are the two assignments that I give under my teaching. Concept mapping and then writing a narrative based on the concept mapping. Now, as you look, as you look at this logic model, evidence of student learning is where instructors often get dragged down in this process. They teach, they have these wonderful ideas, but often they're not thinking through, how am I going to document that my students are learning? That is the hardest part of this model. That's the hardest part of the scholarship of teaching and learning is to think through how am I documenting student learning. So I want you to reflect on, your own, uh, on, on a class that you have. And I want you to ask yourself, you may have some great ideas, you may have some great assignments. How are you demonstrating that it's impacting their learning? If you can start to define, operationalize, and conceptualize evidence of student learning, you're well on your way to the scholarship of teaching and learning. So for me, let me see how we're doing on time. 50, about 15 minutes left. This is an example, this is an example of assignment number one that I was telling you about concept mapping. So this is actually one of, one of my students' concept maps. So they take all of these ideas that they're learning about and they're putting them together, they're making, they're making linkages. That was all good and well but then the question became, even though they're doing this, how do I know that they're learning? One thing I could do is compare their map before and after, at the beginning, at the end of the semester. 
But what I had him do, the, my first effort at this, was to, and that's why I did the narrative piece related to the assignment. So the students take this picture, let's say this, her name was Betsy, and she writes a three-page paper about what does this mean to her. These linkages, these relationships, these concepts. And then what we did with those papers, we took those papers line by line from the beginning of the semester to the end of the semester, and we coded each sentence, each sentence that they wrote, and we placed it in Bloom's taxonomy of Bloom's six levels of, of knowledge, of conceptualization, um, knowledge, understanding, applications, um, evaluation, and cre cre creativity. So that, that began, that helped us to tie together, and this became, this became my first published paper that meets the definition of the scholarship of teaching and learning. Because I went through that whole process of concept mapping. This this is my last slide I'll show you. So in 16, 17, and 18, I've been able to produce three very high-level papers that meet the definition of the scholarship of teaching and learning largely because of logic modeling. So I want you to think through. These are, these are the references, and this middle one is the reference for the concept map that was just up there. So I want you to picture this. When you do this, and at the end, you really have your literature review in your ideas and your learning goals. You've thought through, this is my philosophy. What's your philosophy based on? What support is there for that philosophy? Your learning goals, you're going to describe them in your literature review. Your teaching is going to have a lot of methods in it. And your results are really your student learning. How are you documenting that your students learned? What I want to do now, we have about, I think, about 10 minutes left. On your very last page is this blank. You have four blank boxes. And to make this a little more interactive, I'm going to ask you to reflect for a minute, a couple minutes, and I want you to take one of your classes, and I want you to try to work through these four boxes. What's your philosophy? How is that philosophy impacting your learning goals? How does that inform what you're trying to teach? And most importantly, and most difficult, how are you showing that it's being effective? When you can work through those four boxes and then send a manuscript for peer review, that is the very definition of the scholarship of teaching and learning, which to me is the highest form of the scholarship of teaching. So take a couple minutes, work through this, See what you can come up with, and then let's have a discussion as we, as we uh, wrap this up. Okay, let's, let's, let's visit a little bit. What, what, let's talk about what this was like for you. Um, to try to put content into these four boxes, what, t tell me what it was like. What, what did you, how did you experience it? Marla. I know one of the things that I had to do was to was write a teaching philosophy and then use that in teacher education. 
Uh huh. Right, so right. Know, this is how I teach. This is why I teach this way. Uh huh. Backwards, and then okay, this, these are my thoughts. Uh huh. And put and put you know uh, references on. Where yeah. So, so in some cases, it you might have to do it backwards. Yeah, and I I would say Marla, I would say that's probably the more common. I think that's probably more common than 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 forward to than forward because I think I think that's how we learn. I think that's how it works. We get. We like these ideas, and then we're reading about something. We go, oh, that really resonates with me. What's that about? And that starts to become, you start to formulate your, your teaching philosophy. Other thoughts, other impressions? Kim? I'm, I'm similar to Marla. Um, I was exposed to Howard Gardner years and years ago. Uh-huh. Thank you, Kim. We have just about four minutes. Um, I'm being signed. How many of you felt, what, what did you experience out of these four categories, philosophy, goals, teaching, student learning, what did you experience as the most difficult one? Please. Uh-huh. Okay. So so were the, were their learning goals easy for you? Um, yeah, kind of. Okay. Okay. What, what was the hardest one? What do you think would be the hardest one out of those four, four categories for you? Yeah, writing the philosophy. Okay, writing the philosophy for you would be hardest. How about you? Uh-huh. And we are, I mean, we're very much caught in this loop of traditional exams, traditional papers, all these types of things, and I don't absolutely know with 100% certainty that this is tapping into what it is I want them to learn or know. If I'm asking them to become better critical thinkers and consumers of information, how do I gauge that? Right, right. That's a tough one, huh? That's those, those, those become... Those become that to me. That's very a good example of why that measuring student learning. I think for most people, is the challenge. What 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 might be some of the easiest ways of measuring student learning that, that we're already doing? Pre, go ahead. Pre pre and post tests. Pre pre and post tests are 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 certainly an acceptable way. Of, of measuring student learning. But I guess I want you to take from here, there's many, many more ways, only limited by our own creativity, to assess student learning. Is the same projects, you know, some of the performance, um, like when they have to write some concept map, that takes some thinking that goes into that. And I, I think sometimes you don't think about what it is, I mean, we know what we're asking them to do, but we don't necessarily call it evidence of learning. Uh-huh. 
Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. Last comment I know, then I need to wrap up. No, you're good. So, yeah. So, so in your way, your field is probably it's probably easier to be more objective than say some of the other fields. You have some measurements that that that, that, that I think lend itself to this. I need to wrap up, but I hope I if you could take one take home message, it would be when you do logic modeling, it really sets you up for the scholarship of teaching and learning. So that when you come, when it comes time to publish a manuscript or develop a manuscript, you've already worked through those key components of a literature review, a methods, and the results section when done right. So thank you for this opportunity. I hope it was beneficial to you.